Well, you can, you can get from that that the book, while it's dense, is understandable, you know? It really is written, I feel, for someone who, who, who wants to know, you know, how things can be in this situation, who want to make sense of that headline. So you obviously know a tremendous amount, but I want to say, you can read this book, you know? It's, it, uh, it's dense, but it's very readable. I want to say that. Thank you. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, I wanted to ask you first, we, we see domestic law being forged. I think we can kind of see that that is made by human beings. We see the fingerprints on mm -hmm. that. We know that slavery was legal. We know that the Supreme Court made George W. Bush president. You know, we, with mm. domestic law, it's a little more close up and we can think of it as a forged thing. But I think for most of us, international law is more opaque. We sort of lazily imagine that it's kind of like US law writ larger or that somehow all the countries mm -hmm. got together and decided how it would work. What should we know about the origins and the, the scope, if you will, of international law? Sure. That's a great question. There is actually a definition for international law in the International Court of Justice statute, um, <laughs> Article 38. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like wipe the brain. I'm not going to tell you the subsection. Let me just keep it moving. Um, but there it's defined as deriv uh, derived of two thing three things. One is um, treaties, which are basically a form of explicit consent between uh, two or more states, usually multilateral treaties are what we come to understand as international law. They are co international contracts that all states sign onto um, and which they you know, are subject to as a matter of their explicit consent. There's also something known as customary law, which is implicit consent, which is comprised of what states do um, in practice and what states believe is legal, opinion o juris. And so those two things don't have to ever be written anywhere, but can crystallize as a matter of practice in what states do over time. And the third place, the third source is general principles, which are basically gap fillers. I start in, in, the, in the present to go back to the past, which is that this is the way that we understand international law now. Um, which is basically a state-centric order that has you know, steadily begun to acknowledge other rights-bearing agents like organizations and individuals. But the origins of international law is actually an imperial treaty and the desire to navigate who owns which sea routes. And so it, begin, it begins as an bi international business venture. Um, and, 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 and comes to be crystallized as basically uh, imperial law. Imperial law, in its first articulation, it was used to justify the slaughter of indigenous peoples um, in the Americas through the language of law. First by acknowledging that just because they don't believe in Christ doesn't mean that they're outside of uh, the scope of law, that, that, that they're not outside of the scope, they will be recognized because they practice their own form of faith, but that because they are not adhering to uh, European law or imperial law, that they, because they don't recognize it, they don't have to be regulated by it either. I mean, talk about a pretzel. Um, but that's the origin of it. That's the origin of it, and it has, and, and so we see, and, and that basically justifies the slaughter of, of indigenous peoples in the language of law rather than all out force. And subsequently, Subsequently, as states have increased, the number of states have increased, they've been included into this order, right? So they've had to accept what came before them. I describe this in the book as, you know, the sordid origins of international law, um, but it's, it's one that constitutes the form that we can overcome in the ways that I describe. The only thing that I will say is that what I, I think a lot, I, you know, I just think it's worthwhile to mention is that we didn't have states until something like 200 years ago. Right. This is a new concept. And so this is, that's why I call it imperial you know, law. And then as the number of states increase, their participation in this international uh, legal system changes the law, but also subjects, to, subjects them to these um, sordid origins. Thank you. OK, so the New York Times last May said that Donald Trump's moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv 
quote, swept aside 70 years of American neutrality. <laughs> well, okay, so the it, audience can answer yeah, this exactly. one. Exactly. <laughs> um, obviously, the U.S. gives Israel billions of dollars, shields it from censure in the U.N. Could Israel do what it does without U.S. backing? And in particular, how important is U.S. acceptance or promulgation of these legal fictions that you talk about? Yeah, no doubt. So um, the, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. The Israel has been able to achieve what it has through some imperial tutelage, first under the British and then the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it, what it does is, is it could not do on its own. And even if the U.S. fades, they might have other allies, so also not to exceptionalize the U.S. in this framework, right? Or to exceptionalize Israel. Um, but the U.S. was a neutral power up until 1967. It was what the Palestinians preferred as having the mandatory power over the British. British. They saw them as neutral. Uh, the U.S. Um, did vote to recognize Israel's membership at the United Nations in 1948, but wasn't necessarily a primary ally. We don't see the shift that comes to define our present until the 1967 war. And the reason that we see it then under the Lyndon B. Johnson administration is because Israel achieves in six days what is seen as a miraculous victory against several Arab armies in the span of six days. And the U.S. sees now in Israel a significant Cold War ally in the Middle East. So whereas before the U.S. had adhered to a stalemate policy of basically uh, maintaining no peace, no war between, you know, um, uh, friendly Arab monarchies and Israel, after 1967, the U.S. says, well, we don't need to do that. The U.S., the Israel should be our primary ally. And they inaugurate, the Johnson administration inaugurates two policies that continue to define U.S. policy. One is maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge, which means that they sustain military funding to Israel so that Israel can defeat any single Middle Eastern army on its own or all of them put together. Okay, that's why there will never be sanctions uh, according to the US. US will never sanction Israel for this reason. They do not want to diminish its qualitative military edge. It's also why they're hush-hush about Israel's nuclear program, right. which is not subject to a proliferation you know, treaty. And they maintain a secret. The second policy that they inaugurated was even more consequential, I think, which is the land, well, not more, but as consequential, which is um, the land for peace framework that's enshrined in UN Security Council Resolution 242 that basically establishes that Israel will retain the territories it occupied in 1967 as consideration for a contractual agreement to be returned and exchanged with the Arabs for a permanent peace. So they get to keep what wasn't theirs in order to achieve permanent peace to establish Israel's, um, normalizing Israel's status in the Middle East forever, right? And Egypt and Jordan, by the way, vote for this right. um, in the Security Council, which is you know, what causes some fracture amongst the Palestinians. Let me not go down that road. Um, let me stop here to say that this land for peace framework is significant because it is precisely this logic of achieving a political outcome that is not restricted by any international norms or principles, which has moved the US to define international law as counterproductive to a, a resolution, which is why they have, in the UN Security Council, issued 40, I think it's now 45 vetoes in the Security Council to prohibit any international resolution to, this, to, to the Palestinian question. And the last veto was the Obama administration when it used its first veto in office in order to block a resolution condemning settlements using language that was lifted from US foreign policy on settlements. So since 1967, the US has spoken out of both sides of its mouth, on the one hand telling us that the settlements are illegal and counterproductive to peace. On the other hand, they've provided the military, finan you know, financial, and diplomatic support that have enabled Israel to continue to do what it does. So ch changing the facts on the ground while maintaining a, a legal conversation that's sort of 
separate, you know, almost like it's, it's somewhere else. Well, let's talk, I, you talk about the U.S. resisting the internationalization mm -hmm. of this question. Yeah. You could talk a little bit about that and then also, so then where does, where do international organizations, where does the UN, where does the International Criminal Court, what about these international organizations that might seem like a site for this to it be? It might seem like a site. That might seem like it a site. It might seem like it. Um, I don't want to be too cynical, so I'll answer the question and then I'll give you the optimist. Good. Um, <laughs> it's for that. So do you all know, I think it was in 2015, the the Palestinian delegation with its allies successfully lobbied the Human Rights Council um, of, you know, the Human Rights Council, basically all they got them to do against formidable U.S. Um, opposition, what they got them to do was to pass a resolution that says they were going to publish a list of all businesses that were operating in the settlements. Okay? That's it. They weren't going to call for boycott. Right. They weren't going to sanction them. All they had to do was to publish a list of all the businesses operating in the settlements. It has not been published. And, the re and here's the Human Rights Council that voted for it favorably, and yet the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the previous one and now the current one, have both abstained from passing that resolution. We don't know the reasons why. I can conjecture they probably are thinking about their next career move and they don't want to destroy it, which is the same reason at the International Criminal Court we're probably not going to see Fatima Bensouda actually bring any claims against Israel. It's going to be a lose-lose situation. Now, that being said, that does not mean that advocacy at the UN is for naught. Mm -hmm. To the contrary, I think that what that create, all of those efforts create learning moments, they create opportunities for us to create new um, alliances. They create opportunities for us to build mass mobilization. They create opportunities for us to create new language and new realities on the ground. Because this legal language is consequential, at least in the way that states internalize them, even in their internal foreign policy making, even if the law does not have the capacity to command state behavior or to punish transgressions. Uh, Greg Shupak, writing for FAIR, uh, was looking into the way that U.S. corporate media talk about the future um, in Israel and Palestine, and was finding things like this. Uh, the New York Times had an editorial in May of 2018 about Israel's mass murder of 62 un un unarmed Palestinians on May 14th, and the paper criticized successive right-wing Israeli governments for expanding Jewish settlements in the West Bank on land Palestinians expected to be part of any Palestinian state, as well as blaming Trump for failing to urge a peace formula in which Palestinians and Israelis would negotiate core issues, such as establishing boundaries between the two states. The Independent said that Trump's moving the embassy has killed stone dead any remaining hopes of peace and a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians. So we see in media an equation of peace and a two-state solution, mm. you know, and a, a, a burying, Shupak mm -hmm. was saying, of the, the very idea of, a one, of one state. You know, it's not, it's not on the table. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not an option. The Wall Street Journal had it, it's the Wall Street Journal, it had an opinion piece that said that partition is the only real alternative to a Yugoslavia-like single state in which two rival peoples devour each other. So mm. the idea of there being a single state in which everyone is a citizen and enjoys human rights and votes is, is, not, is not there. And yet, when you talk to people, they say a two-state solution is, is dead. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's, it's not viable. Yeah. It's not something that's going to happen. And yet, it still is lifted up in the media as the only possible thing, but now Trump's ruined it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, let's see someone resurrect it. Um, there's a lot of ways to answer this and to respond to it. So let me try to, let me try to go through it. Mm -hmm. One is to say that when we say two-state solution, we're really just saying Palestinian state. Yeah. Because, yeah, we don't use that language, and I think we should. Right? Because when we say two states, we, we're establishing a false parity that doesn't exist. Right. Israel has been a state since 1948. Yeah. 
Palestinians have recognized it in 1988 and again in 1993. And so Israel is not in question. There is no existential crisis of, 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 of Israel as a state. The only state that doesn't exist is the Palestinian state. And I think even reversing that language and talking about it as such will shift the way that we have these conversations so that, for example, when I do media interviews after, right, after Trump announcement of the moving of the embassy of Jerusalem, I don't get the question of why won't Palestinians negotiate? Because if you've understood that Israel has torpedoed the one sure way of enshrining Jewish sovereignty by establishing the Palestinian state and has torpedoed that option nonetheless, there's a lot to talk about. That it actually has built a wall, 85% of its length runs through the West Bank and confiscates 13% of Palestinian lands. That it has increased the number of settlers from 200,000 in 1993 to 600,000, I think 700,000 even, today. The fact that it no longer recognizes that East Jerusalem will be a capital of Palestine, the fact that it wants to annex 60% of the West Bank outright, the fact that they're repeating this mantra that there is no such thing as a Palestinian people and now trying to set the Gaza Strip apart on its own to create their own statelet, that was Israel. It is the only power there that is able to control the facts on the ground. Palestinians can't control, change those facts on the ground. I read this today, Ra'af Izraq writes in a 2016 article that Israel has equal control over a Palestinian day laborer and of the Palestinian president. Mahmoud Abbas can't travel without Israeli um, permission, right? So that's, that's the first thing that we really should talk about. This is not the two-state solution. This is the Palestinian state, which would get us to ask Israel the question, what, why have you rejected it and created this new course? And that's, that's an interesting inquiry. The second thing is that Oslo, if we're really honest about the peace process, Oslo sets up a sovereignty trap that Palestinians can't escape. It's basically an autonomy framework. And it's, I keep saying verbatim, history keeps repeating itself. It's the time collapse. We are in the past and the future. Um, so, um, but literally, in 1978, when Egypt and Israel were negotiating the um, Camp David Accord that comes to fruition in 1979, they establish a Middle East peace framework that says that there should be a peace process that begins with an interim, you know, interim solution and then culminates in two years of final or, or two years of an interim solution and then enters into final status negotiations. Yeah. Exactly. In 1993, that's exactly what's adopted with minor differences um, that I won't get into. But why is that important? Because Oslo nowhere ever promises that the outcome will be a Palestinian state. It is not a peace process for a state. It is an autonomy framework. It is permanent, permanent autonomy, where Palestinians will exist as derivative sovereigns of the Israeli state in what will amount to Bantustans or reservations. So when we talk about, let's go back to Oslo, we're basically saying, let's, let's take Palestinians back into their sovereignty trap, where in order to prove eligibility for self-rule, they have to pursue a politics of acquiescence uh, to prove that they're good Arabs to the U.S. and Israel, except they'll never get the state in return. It's a losing bet. It's a losing bet where now um, we're um, indentured, um, which is why I, I suggest that we move beyond that in order to think about how do we get out of the sovereignty trap and ways forward. And the only thing I'll caution is that even as we talk about the one-state solution, that we should even complicate equality mm -hmm. and citizenship as a model, because as we've seen here in the United States, where indigenous people yep. uh, were enfranchised and black people were later enfranchised, citizenship doesn't mean That's equality. And you can it can become a trap for domination if we don't reconfigure what we think of that. Grace Lee Boggs said you know, this, and, and this is how, why I draw from this, because I, I want equality, but I don't want my equality to be defined by Israelis. I don't want my freedom 
to def be defined by what Israelis have and I can have as much. I want to define my own freedom. That's a different kind of equality. It's an equality to live and to thrive. And Grace Lee Boggs says something very similar um, when she says that this isn't about black people becoming equal to whites. It's about black people becoming equal to the vision of, they have of themselves. And so just to complicate that a little bit. That's wonderful. Well, we don't, we don't have much more time, but I wanted to, to say you have made the point that this is not about Donald Trump. This is US policy. <laughs> this is not about Netanyahu or the Israeli right. The policies that we're talking about, as you outline, have been essentially policy for, for decades. Yeah. But then, um, you know, Phyllis Bennis said that people do Trump's blatant, Netanyahu and Trump's blatant um, celebration, you know, of the occupation and of these sets of policies draws criticism and that maybe makes an opening, you know, yep. for, for building a movement. And I wanted to, 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 to end this conversation with that forward looking thing, with that wind, you know, right. idea of, you talk about a rights based alternative, you know, part, part of, I feel that activists are often taunted, you know, well, what's your solution? You know, <laughs> show me the map, you know, show me exactly blueprint. what you're going to do. The blueprint, it's there you five, go. Ten year, there year you plan. go. Yeah. And we're kind of cowed by it. But we're allowed to just say no. We're allowed to say we're opposed to something because it's wrong and to make our, our road by walking, yeah. right? And so I, I wanted to just say, do, do you see, I, you know, I'm talking with Josh Rubner, um, who used to be at, um, the Committee for Palestinian Rights, and he was saying, talking about BDS and saying, he sees it flowering, you know? We've got college campuses. Brown there, University yesterday. Brown University yesterday. Yeah. De church denominations representing tens of millions of people. I wanna say, first of all, Josh Rubner did wanna say that uh, we should not reduce the movement for Palestinian freedom to BDS. BDS is a tool, a set of tools that is part of a bigger picture. But he said he thinks it's becoming a mainstream idea that something is different. And so I just wanted to ask you finally, first of all, do you think the response to this would have been different five years ago, you know, <laughs> even three years ago? But then also, if you could just talk a little bit about how we, how we start growing, or is, yeah. it exists. I don't wanna say there's nothing already, yeah. but how, how, do we, how do we think about this going forward? How do we use the outrage that we feel to, to start moving us forward towards Palestinian real freedom? Janine, you're great. <laughs> I really, really enjoy this. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> This multi-layered question taking us through. I, I started, I started, you know, going somewhere, and, I was like, oh, wait, come back. Okay. <laughs> and then it winds up not really. Thank you for having us dream a little bit. No, yeah. really. Let me start. Yeah, I, I, I think there is so much comfort in our disdain for Trump that we use, I think, to absolve ourselves of responsibility for decades of, you know, malfeasance. Yeah. Um, not just towards the question of Palestine and to, towards Palestinians, but of, of, of everything that we know at home. I mean, the fact that six children have died at the border as they were separated from their families, right, makes us really outraged as it should be, and they're held in detention. But it was the Obama administration that inaugurated that and built many of those detention centers, right? So it's that kind of, you know, that kind of work that makes it, you know, the, it was Obama, the first black president that was in office during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement and yet could not move forward a program towards abolition or forget, fine, if that's too much, at least, you know, to address mass incarceration, right? So there's a way that we use Trump in order to absolve ourselves of that responsibility and the same is happening right now. The differences in unfairness to you know, most audiences who don't follow this closely is that Trump has been so explicit. He has removed the emperor's clothes. Right. And so now, if you, if you continue to participate in the rhetoric, you are explicitly part of the problem because you're in, in, you're in knowing denial. Yeah. 
So that's where you know this is actually really helpful. It's also really helpful for people who don't understand what ethno-nationalism is, what you know supremacy looks like, what militarized supremacy looks like um, abroad. When they see it here in the United States, it becomes more legible. So that we can understand an alliance between Trump and Netanyahu as signifying something very particular that makes this legible to us. Um, so I think that, yes, this is a great opportunity. It's been a great opportunity to basically, uh, for movement work, to usher in uh, the squad into Congress, which I think has been a movement victory. It's not a, con right? It's a movement victory to pave that path of, of, of defining what's possible. And here is where the future is. You asked me about how this book would have been received. This book, I think, is, is, being, is, is entering the conversation now. I mean, another book about Palestine in 2019 after 102 years, that was definitely an anxiety I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the fact that it's been received in the way that it has, I think, is also because of movement. Yep. It's because of movement. It's because of, you know, I start writing the book at a time when we have a, accepted that settler colonialism is distinct from colonialism as an enterprise and how that functions and what it means. So that now when I discuss Israel, I'm definitely not exceptionalizing it. I'm comparing Israel to Canada and the United States and New Zealand and Australia, right? And West Papua and, you know, so on and so forth that you, I'm not exceptionalizing it. I'm placing it within this broader framework that we can understand. The Black Lives Matter movement has made very clear to us that political sovereignty and political enfranchisement is not the horizon for freedom. And so how else can we imagine futures? And so that's, I think, what has made, you know, my book is in conversation with those movements mm -hmm. and with those literatures. Um, and so I think that's what's made it, uh, for me, I'm entering into something where I, where I want to insist that the question of Palestine is not about something over there, but it's about something that we're living over here. It brings into sharp relief US imperialism which we don't talk about in, the, in using that language much anymore since you know, the early 90s when the US emerges as you know, the singular power in a unipolar world. So we no longer have that language to discuss it, but it brings into sharp relief. Why is the United States interested in the Middle East? Why, why is it, it so invested in Israel? Why does it create alliances with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and with Sisi's Egypt, right? Why is it invested in Iraq in the way that it is and it continues to be there and mum on, on the question of Yemen? Why then, if we go from there, if we're thinking about that, then why is it continue, uh, uh, continuing to occupy Hawaii? How is that a site of the great, you know, uh, the, one of the largest military commands, the Pacific Command, which oversees 50% of the world's population in 36 states. I mean, right, the question of Palestine is drawing us in to think about the US outside of the US because it's never just been an American exceptionalism. And so when, I, when people ask me, well, what should we do? How do we get people to understand Palestine? Because it feels so far away, I say, talk about standing rock, right? Talk about you know, invite Nick Estes to tell you about that, um, that struggle um, and many of our other compas to talk about settler colonialism ongoing. How is it that building the border on the Mexico um, US border, not just about immigrant rights, but also about the autumn nation who are being severed from their peoples across this militarized border now. Talk about um, mass incarceration in the United States and racial capitalism. Talk about things here to bring what we know and should know better to bring into sharper relief uh, the question of Palestine and our futures, which are, for better or for worse, entwined. It's all of us or none of us. So that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can finish it.
Thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you all.